Okay, good morning everybody. Today uh, our second year resident Tim Reese is going to present a talk about esophageal carcinoma. Enjoy. Dear colleagues, today's talk will be about esophageal cancer. In uh, cancer-related death, the um, esophageal cancer is in the seventh most cancer-related death in male. Um, and in female, the esophageal cancer does not occur, which makes the male gender a risk factor for cancer-related death and for the occurrence of esophageal cancer. In Switzerland, we have about 500 new diagnoses per year. And um, when we talk about the different types of, um, the, of esophageal cancer, there are two c common types um, of, the, of this esophageal cancer. Maybe the first question to the um, residents, what are the two most um, common types of esophageal cancer? It's the squamous cell and the adenocarcinoma. <coughs> That's correct. When we talk about the esophageal cancer, the squamous cell carcinoma and the adenocarcinoma provide over 95% um, of all malignancies of the esophagus and the um, proportion of the adenocarcinoma um, um, sharply rise and increase over the last um, decades and the proportion of the squamous cell carcinoma decreased over the last decades. Um, but the total number of squamous cell carcinomas um, maintained more or less stable, only the total number of adenocarcinomas um, was increasing. This is uh, most likely because of the different risk factors for the squamous cell carcinoma and the adenocarcinoma. For example, for the squamous cell carcinoma, we have smoking, alcohol, or hot beverage, for example, as risk factors. And for adenocarcinoma, we have the reflux disease, the Barrett's esophagus, obesity, or the metabolic syndrome. And those risk factors have increasing incidence over the last year. So, um, for example, the prevalence of obesity here within uh, different um, uh, countries is sharply rising over the last years. And also the incidence of the Barrett's esophagus is uh, increasing over the last years. And so obesity and Barrett's esophagus is a risk factor for, esophageal, uh, for adenocarcinoma. This is why the adenocarcinoma of the esophagus is increasing. So maybe with this information, the second question to the residents. So um, when, when we have those risk factors for adenocarcinoma, where would you assume uh, um, that the um, adenocarcinoma is more likely to be? So I think the adenocarcinoma is more in the lower part of the esophagus or in the junction of esophagus and stomach. Yes, that's correct. Because of this reflux disease or the Barrett's esophagus, the adenocarcinoma is uh, uh, more likely to be located in the lower part of the esophagus or the gastric esophageal junction, whereas like smoking and, and, and alcohol and hot beverage, the, the local damage occurs in the whole part of the um, um, esophagus. So that's why the squamous cell carcinoma can be located everywhere in the esophagus. For both cancers, we have um, the same clinical, more or less the same clinical manifestations. Maybe the last question to one of the residents, what are the typical manifestations, the symptoms uh, of the um, esophageal carcinoma? I think there are several uh, symptoms. I think dysphagia, adenophagia, um, people, they can't eat them much, so I think that we have weight loss and uh, maybe Fatigue, um, yeah. Yes, you named most of them. The, of course, the obstruction of the esophagus, and when the obstruction of the esophagus is more than 50%, we have the solid food dysphagia, or dinophagia, weight loss, and when the recurrent laryngeal nerve is involved, patients suffer from hoarseness, of, and also uh, aspiration permeia can be observed. But we have to say those are only late symptoms, and all those symptoms indicate an advanced disease. And patients uh, at a time of diagnosis have 50% of those patients have metastasis. When we come now to the diagnostic worker, we have to differ between the local status and the distant disease, the, the metastasis. For the local status, we have the upper endoscopy, the endoscopic ultrasound, and always, of course, performed with biopsy. Uh, but additional to that, for the squamous cell carcinoma, um, 
um, a pharyngoscopy uh, um, should be performed because uh, patients with a squamous cell carcinoma have in 10 to 20 percent uh, also a carcinoma of the neck or the pharynx. And the squamous cell carcinoma uh, bronchoscopy should be um, performed to rule out any um, invasion uh, of the trachea or, or the bronchus. And for the distant disease, for the staging, we have the PET-CT and the CT scan. Now we go um, through the different diagnostic tools. Uh, for example, the upper endoscopy is very important. It's uh, for the tumor location and the length of the tumor. This is very important, for example, for surgical planning to, um, to see whether resection margins uh, can be or will be. And um, we, we can take a biopsy, and the greater the number of the biopsy, the higher is the diagnostic accuracy um, for the biopsy, with seven biopsies up to 98% uh, of accuracy. And of course, conventional contrast radiography can be performed, but do not support any further information to the diagnostic workup. Then we have the endoscopic ultrasound. The endoscopic ultrasound is for the local extent, so for the, for the T in the TNM classification, um, 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 how, deep the, the, how deep the tumor is infiltrating the esophagus or is uh, infiltrating other structures. And of course, we can see if there's any positive um, lymph nodes in, um, around the um, esophagus. But we have to say that the local extent, so the T and N status, does not affect any treatment when metastasis, so distant disease, um, um, are present. Uh, this is diagnosed with the computer tomography or the PET scan for the staging. It's, uh, this is to identify the metastasis and the distant disease, most um, uh, commonly in, um, located in liver and lung. This procedure, this diagnostic tool has uh, two disadvantages. They not, can, cannot detect very small lesions and do not um, have a good accuracy for the local status. This is why um, um, the local status is always assessed via endoscopy and um, endoscopic ultrasound in combination to a, to a CT scan or to a PET uh, scan. Um, and the PET CT scan is 20% um, better to um, identify those distant um, uh, metastases. When we have um, this, this diagnostic workup, I can sum up the endoscopy and the PET scan or the CT scan must be performed. This is for um, to differ what kind of um, 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 tumor we have, the localization, how, um, how is the stadium, the, the infiltration of the esophagus, is the patient resectable, and do we have any metastasis or not. And when we have a patient that can be assessed for surgery, the patient should go under a functional workup. This um, contains cardiologic diagnostics, pulmonary evaluation. This is very important because um, some operations need a one lung ventilation. And we have a couple of contraindications. For example, severe COPD is a contraindication for operation. And of course, we have to um, um, assess the liver and kidney function, the vascular status, comorbidities, or operations in the past, um, the anesthesiology and mobility and nutritional status must be assessed. The nutritional status is very important. For example, patients that had a weight loss um, about 20% over the last six months should undergo um, nutritional geronal feeding. Um, and for example, while this nutritional supplementation takes place, a weight loss during this nutritional supplementation so also a contraindication to surgery, as well as liver cirrhosis and with uh, signs of portal hypertension. So we have um, this um, uh, therapy algorithm, um, which I want to go through quickly because I um, will um, talk about any every kind um, of treatment a little bit more detail. For when we have a resectable um, patient, um, superficial cancers can be resected endoscopically or via surgery, uh, locally extended. Um, Locally extended carcinomas should go undergo neoadjuvant um, chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery, and when we, we have a patient that is not resectable or have metastasis, they should undergo palliative treatment. So, like I said earlier, 50% of the patients um, have metastasis at the time of diagnosis, and those patients should undergo palliative treatment with chemotherapy, with or without the uh, without radiation. 
but it comes along with a very severe survival. For example, this, is, this couple of myocraft shows um, patients that had metastatic um, uh, disease or non-metastatic unrejectable um, uh, cancers. All of those patients underwent palliative treatment and we see for the metastatic group a five-year survival of 0%. And for the unrejectable non-metastatic patients, we had a um, five-year survival lower than 20%. Those patients should undergo um, palliative treatment and best supportive care. For example, the improvement of quality of life, nutritional, uh, nutrition, feeding, or stand placing um, in the esophagus. When we now talk about the um, resectable cancers, we uh, have to look at the TNM staging a little bit more closely. We have um, uh, the superficial cancers is uh, T1A and T1B that infiltrates only the mucosa and the submucosa. And um, uh, the, T1, the, the T2 cancer um, infiltrates the muscularis but not, does not break through the esophagus and the locally extended um, tumors like T T3 uh, is, um, is breaking through the esophagus that can be very, done very easily because the esophagus does not have any serosa. And uh, T4A um, infiltrates structures that can be resected, and T4B infiltrates structures that cannot be resected, for example, the aorta or the trachea. So now the, um, the therapy for the superficial cancers, T1A and T1B, we can do the endoscopic mucosal resection for T1A, like shown in this um, um, figure here or the endoscopic mucosal dissection for T1B. This procedure has a very low mortality rate, of, of course, but this procedure only treats the, the, the local tumor, does not have any effect on the lymph node. For example, as I just said, the, the T1B tumor infiltrates the submucosal, and this is where the lymphatic drainage takes place. So we have a lymph node metastasis, up to 5% in T1A cancers and up to 30% for T1B cancers. And those lymph nodes are not treated with the, um, the endoscopic resection. This is why we have a 10% lower five-year survival for the endoscopic resected patients compared to the surgical. But this, is, um, this endoscopic resection maintains, um, how you discussed today, how to follow up those patients that have um, endoscopically resected, and this is currently under, under discussion. When we have the local regional or the locally advanced disease, for example, the local regional, the T2 tumor that only infiltrates the esophagus, the muscularis, does not infiltrate any uh, other structures around the esophagus, and without any positive lymph nodes, those patients can undergo directly surgery or can be treated with uh, new adjuvant um, uh, chemoradiotherapy. Locally advanced disease, T2 uh, cancers with lymph nodes, or up to um, um, cancers that um, 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 infiltrate resectable um, um, structures without metastasis should, un should undergo new adjuvant uh, treatment. This was shown by the CROSS trial. This is a randomized controlled trial where they um, compared new adjuvant um, treatment with, followed by surgery versus surgery alone in the randomized controlled um, trial. This was publicated in 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is the follow-up study from 2015 um, publicated in the Lancet, and they um, randomized about 180 patients into each arm. And this study shows clearly that the neoadjuvant shimmer radiotherapy followed by surgery is um, has a, a, a highly superior um, uh, survival uh, after five years or, or overall compared to the surgery alone group. Furthermore, um, the improvement of R0 resections were significantly higher for the neoadjuvant treatment followed by surgery compared to the surgery alone group with. Uh, um, 92%. And the reduction of local, regional, and distant progression um, was observed. The complete response for the new adjuvant treatment was 29%. But this study also has some limitations. For example, that they um, included um, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma and used um, a wide range of different operation techniques. 
for the surgical techniques, um, like just mentioned, we have a wide range and wide um, variation of um, surgical approaches and techniques. For example, the resection of the esophagus transthoracic or transhiatal. The uh, anastomosis can be done uh, cervical or in interthoracic. The, after resection of the esophagus, the um, uh, uh, the interposition can be placed by a gastric conduit um, or a colon interposition. And of course, we have the open approach for surgery or the total minimal invasive approach or a hybrid um, um, approach. But all this depends on um, the, the tumor location, which technique is performed, and of course, on the surgeon's experience. We perform often here the I will lose a surfactectomy, which I want to uh, point out um, um, in a more detailed way. But first, I have to um, um, separate the, the surgical approach for the gastroesophageal junction, for example, for the, the levert calcification for the carcinomas of the gastroesophageal junction. Carcinomas type 3 in the Seifert calcifications undergo transiatal extended gastrectomy as well as the type 2. And the type 2 and, um, can also be assessed for esophagectomy like the type 1. So now I want to go in a little bit more into detail for the Iowa Lewis esophagectomy in an example, total minimal invasive, like here performed. Um, for, for example, first step is uh, the, the laparoscopic gastrolysis, followed by the um, preparation of the gastric tube, the gastric conduit. Um, um, this uh, step um, um, maintain, co contains the separation and the, 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 the divided all the gastric um, arteries except of the arteria epipolica gastrica dextra. And um, then the um, esophagectomy takes place um, via thoracoscopy. And um, the continuity is, um, is then circular, circular stapled um, the gastric conduit to the esophagus, and the insertion of the um, um, circular um, stapler is closed with a linear stapler. And uh, this anastomosis can be done very high uh, in, in the chest, very high thoracic. And um, if the anastomosis uh, must take place very high in the, in the, in the neck, uh, the McEwen approach can be performed. This is a um, high cervical anastomosis um, of the esophagus and the gastric conduit. Current discussion is the minimal invasive approach compared to the open approach. This is um, the, the only randomized controlled trial for esophagectomy where they compared the minimal invasive um, uh, to the open esophagectomy, they randomized uh, about 50 patients into each into, into the minimal invasive arm or the, the open approach. The primary outcome were um, pulmonary infections, and um, you can see the minimal invasive group had significant less um, pulmonary infections compared to the open approach, and secondary outcomes like hospital cell were also lower for the minimal invasive group, but other very important factors like the resection margins, R0 and R1, and the mortality, mortality were not different between those groups. But it is still the minimal invasive approach to esophagectomy is, is still a procedure that is highly accepted. For example, in 2007, it, the minimal invasive approach for different um, 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 uh, continents was uh, below 20% and uh, in 2014 in every um, of those um, um, continents the minimal invasive approach is performed, the total minimal invasive approach is performed um, over 40%. When we come to the complications, the, we have to state out that the esophagectomy um, is a is a, an operation with a very high overall morbidity, up to 60%, and typical complications are anastomotic leak, up to 30%, anastomotic stricture, up to 12%, and very high pulmonary complications are presented in the literature with 20 to 27%. This is more or less higher than um, after a major lung resection, for example. And of course, a lymph fistula, hydrothorax, because of the esophagectomy, can occur. And a lot of lots of studies investigated the morbidity and mortality decrease in high volume centers, like this study from 2004, where they investigated the um, impact on, on the high volume centers compared to 
medium, low and very low centers and found out that there's a significant um, reduction of the mortality rate. Also, a very um, a recent publication from this year, um, it shows that patients, that the blue line, the patients that traveled to um, um, a high volume center for a zofagectomy has a much better survival than patients that were treated at the local institution for esophageal, for esophageal cancer and um, received their um, esophagectomy. So for my last slide, I want to sum up the different therapy approaches for the different um, stages of the cancer. For example, the superficial cancers uh, with a, uh, can be assessed via surgery alone or endoscopic resection with the best five-year survival rates. The um, local regional tumors T2 can be undergo surgery directly or pretreated with neoadjuvant therapy. The locally advanced tumors should always undergo neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery, and the locally advanced uh, non resectable um, carcinomas or patients that have metastasis should undergo palliative treatment with a very severe five year survival rate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good presentation and overview of the uh, topic. I have just two questions. You show a slide about sensitivity and specificity, the diagnosis. The diagnosis is mostly an endoscopy. Oh? I mean, when you go, the rest is mostly for the staging. Yes, but the endosonography is also part of the staging because you can uh, have a look at the T category of the uh, local key, T category of the tumor, so the depth of invasion, and you can also have a look at the uh, lymph nodes, the periods of geo lymph nodes that could look suspicious. You can even uh, mm, perform a fine needle aspiration from a suspicious uh, lymph node to rule out uh, a lymph node metastasis. Uh, coming to the uh, benchmark study we did uh, uh, recently, we thought this was a bit uh, beyond the focus of, uh, of this talk. That's why we did not uh, really mention it. Uh, but it was a study on, on total minimal invasive uh, transthoracic esophagectomy with more than 1,000 um, patients involved. And uh, we just um, uh, looked at the, the best patients, the ben benchmark patients, and could show that even in uh, um, the best patients from, from uh, the com their comorbidities and uh, treated by experts, um, the uh, morbidity rate is still quite high. Um, and uh, also the leakage rate, was, for example, was uh, 16%. So we still have uh, in, in expert centers and uh, um, with the best patients and a total minimally invasive approach, considerable complication rate. Any other questions? Thank you also for this uh, beautiful presentation. My question um, is uh, regarding the, the, the choice of technique. The study that you have shown, um, um, the one that randomized open versus minimally invasive surgery, actually showed that R1 resection rate was lower in the minimally invasive group and the R0 resection rate correspondingly was higher, would you actually believe it was not significant, but it was just low numbers? So would you believe that minimally invasive surgery may actually be more precise? Do you maybe have a higher lymph node yield, and would that maybe be even beneficial to these patients? So we have today on uh, minimally invasive versus open or hybrid uh, resections um, are, are are limited, we have to say that. There's still an un ongoing discussion. We have um, some some data that show that, that morbidity, post-operative morbidity is lower after uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery, but it's still under debate whether um, hybrid procedures uh, should be the standard or total minimally invasive. There's also a, a learning curve, um, a steep learning curve, um, and uh, so it's very really difficult to interpret those um, those data today. It's not uh, that's not really conclusive. It's it's not we don't know at the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much.